getting ready to talk about the karyogenic biofilm. One of those four big things that you need to have caries occur. Now before we talk about that, I want to discuss what normal looks like. So we're going to talk just briefly about what's called the acquired pellicle. The acquired pellicle is an organic film that coats the teeth that's actually formed from precipitates or things within the saliva. Now the acquired pellicle occurs naturally. It's always there. If you go get your teeth cleaned right now, within two hours, that acquired pellicle is actually going to redevelop on the tooth. It's going to reestablish itself. You cannot get rid of this. So you think of something like the acquired pellicle. It's going to be there always, right? We try to clean it off. It comes back. If it comes back, it must be important, right? It must have a function. What is that function? Well, there's three big things that the acquired pellicle is thought to actually do. The first thing the acquired pellicle does is it actually protects the enamel. It prevents things from occurring chemically to that enamel. The second thing it does is it actually, the film itself actually reduces friction between the teeth or reduces friction around the teeth with the tissue. So that's kind of neat. It's almost like a lubricant. The third thing the acquired pellicle does, and this is probably the most important function it has in regards to the caries process, is it actually creates a structure or an environment for remineralization to occur. It's able to kind of harbor those minerals that the tooth so desperately needs to reincorporate those into the tooth. Now, when we talk about a biofilm, a plaque biofilm, a dental biofilm, karyogenic biofilm, what are we discussing here? We're specifically talking about a film that contains bacteria, and in the caries process, it's actually karyogenic bacteria, you know, capable of producing a large amount of acid. So it includes a bacteria, it includes byproducts of that bacteria or waste products, and it also includes like extracellular matrix, like water. So the plaque biofilm is two parts, right? You have the bio part, which is your cells, the bacteria. It's a very complex environment. It's like an ecosystem of bacteria present in that film. And the film itself is the actual structure, the actual, you know, the structure that contains that biomatter. So even if a patient does not have certain types of karyogenic bacteria present in their mouth, they're still going to have a plaque biofilm present. The only difference between a patient who does not get caries and a patient who does get caries is the biofilms contain different types of bacteria. In specific situations, they actually contain more karyogenic bacteria in those patients that get caries. Now in patients who do not get caries, the bacteria that's present in that biofilm is still a streptococcus bacteria, but it's more like streptococcus sanguis or streptococcus mitis type populations of bacteria present. So when we talk about karyogenic biofilms, you know, to be able to treat a patient who has caries, you have to understand that caries process on a whole nother level. And so there used to be what's called the nonspecific plaque hypothesis, right? So what does that mean? It basically meant that in the past, there was people that thought, you know, that the plaque itself was just kind of a group of bacteria. It really didn't matter what type of bacteria was present. It really had no influence on the process more than the fact that we knew it was there. We knew plaque had to be present. And if patients didn't keep plaque off of their teeth, then that led to the cavity process and it was basically the patient's fault if they didn't keep plaque off their teeth. And so over time, we've come to know more about that disease process and we actually refer things to more now as a specific plaque hypothesis, meaning that there's specific types of bacteria, specific populations of bacteria present within that plaque biofilm that actually contribute more to that disease process than other types of bacteria. So if we're talking about bacteria in the mouth, let's take a patient that has no cavities, right? They have no caries present. Well, like I said, these patients still have bacteria present in the plaque, but they contain bacteria that is not really considered karyogenic. Now, the key thing you need to remember here is even bacteria that's non-karyogenic they still produce acid, right? They produce acid at a lower level than karyogenic bacteria. And that's one of the big distinguishing factors there is you can have bacteria in your mouth that produce acid, 
but teriogenic specific bacteria, the ones that we typically you know, identify as the all around bad guys for dental caries. Those produce acid at such a high level compared to the other types of bacteria. That's why we consider them cariogenic. When we talk about cariogenic bacteria, there's three types of bacteria that you need to know and you need to understand. The biggest type of bacteria we ever talk about when it comes to caries is strep mutans. Strep mutans is the all around kind of bad guy, bad bacteria that you don't want. That's the one we typically target when we do antimicrobial therapy. That's the one we typically look at when we actually do cariogenic biofilm testing on patients. So that's a huge, huge player in this overall disease process. Typically, anybody that gets caries is gonna have strep mutans present. Now there's other types of bacteria in the mouth that are also kind of like secondary invaders or they're also kind of helping strep mutans fight that caries battle in the mouth. The second bacteria is lactobacilli. Lactobacilli is again like a secondary invader. Strep mutans moves in and lactobacilli is like the reinforcements. They come in and they continue to you know, produce acid, remove minerals from the tooth, and actually destroy that tooth structure. The third type of bacteria you need to know is actinomyces type bacteria. These types of bacteria are typically found associated more with root caries or caries associated with cementum. Now, patients who get root caries, they still have typically high levels of strep mutans, but again, that actinomyces is like a secondary invader. So we talked about strep mutans and how that's kind of a big player in this overall caries process. Now, we also mentioned that when we test patients' saliva or we test their bacterial counts, we're typically looking at strep mutans as the primary player or the primary bacteria we're looking at. Now there's certain measurements or certain values you want to understand when you're looking at these bacterial counts. Now based off the Anderson medical model, which we're going to discuss in more detail later, there's actually a critical level or a critical measurement of strep mutans that you actually assess when you do a bacterial test. Now if the strep mutans level is 100,000 colony forming units or greater, that's actually considered for high risk of dental caries. So we typically want to try to keep that strep mutans number lower than 100,000 colony forming units.